Hey, this is Leo for Actualized.org, and in this episode, I'm going to be talking about 5-MeO-DMT, the most powerful psychedelic in the world, the magic pill to enlightenment and God. Warning, the information provided here is strictly for educational purposes. Misusing 5-MeO-DMT can be lethal. The first thing we need to clear up is the difference between 5-MeO-DMT and regular DMT. These are not the same things at all, even though they sound similar. You've probably heard about people smoking DMT, and that's a very powerful psychedelic. But 5-MeO is more powerful. It's 10 to 20 times more potent than regular DMT which is quite crazy if you've ever tried DMT. But not only that, it produces qualitatively different results. So it's not just more of the same, it's different. Very different, even though the names are similar. So don't confuse these two substances. 5-MeO-DMT, I believe, is the most important psychedelic for the work that we're doing here with Actualize.org. I personally am not interested in just tripping out or experiencing pleasurable experiences. Uh, that's not why I use psychedelics. I'm interested in raising my consciousness to the highest levels humanly possible, uh, using whatever methods or techniques are out there that allow me to do this. And 5-MeO, from what I've discovered, is beyond all other psychedelics. And it's extremely practical in its ability to transform your consciousness in permanent ways. So what I believe, this is my theory, and this is something that needs to be proven, which I will be working on to prove for myself, is that 5-MeO can be used to have genuine enlightenment experiences, and also not only to have these peak experiences and then coming back down to normal egoic existence, but to actually attain permanent enlightenment. I think that 5-MeO is capable of doing that. In fact, I found an individual who has successfully done that, and uh, I'll talk more about that as we continue. But first, let's address this issue of the uh, anti-magic pill dogma that I see out there. So, you know, people who are into personal development, generally, we take it sort of as a dogma that magic pills are bad. And that anything like is a shortcut shouldn't be done, shouldn't be used because it's not genuine, it's not natural, it's not good. That's kind of like what we might think. But let's remember this notion of magic pills. The reason that we don't like generally magic pills is because generally many magic pills don't work. You see, we're not opposed to magic pills on principle. If you're opposed to anything on principle, that's ego. That's dogma. I'm opposed to magic pills when they have bad consequences and when they flat out don't work. That's a problem. And I continue to be opposed to magic pills in that regard. But let's also consider that humanity, if we take a look at the broader perspective, humanity has invented many successful, highly effective magic pills throughout the last several thousand years of our civilization. And by magic pills, let's really broaden out this idea, because what is a magic pill? It's really just a technology. It's a technology that works very effectively and can save you a lot of time or energy. That's really what a magic pill is. Now the question is, is the technology effective or not? We can find many examples of highly effective magic pill technologies. For example, computers, penicillin, other types of medicines, modern medical surgery, which can cure certain kinds of cancer and can do other certain kinds of stuff, electricity, right? Um, uh, GPS systems, the internet. So these things are real magic pills. And uh, these we have no problem using because we're not opposed to them on any ideological grounds. For example, if you need to add up a billion different numbers, 
you have no problem using a calculator or a computer to crunch those numbers for you when otherwise it would have taken you 10 years to add them all up. But see, when it comes to spirituality, a lot of people, because they hold dogmas about spirituality and because the ego is so involved with it, then they'll have this objection. And they'll say, well, Leo, you know, don't use psychedelics. If you use psychedelics to have some sort of consciousness, higher consciousness experience, that's not genuine. That's not authentic. But you have to see it from the broader perspective. From the broader perspective, it's just a technology. That's what it is. And the question is, does this technology work? And the only way you can know is by trying it yourself. Lots and lots of trials. Then you can see if it really works and you can see what are the long-term consequences, what are the repercussions, is it sustainable and all of that. Okay. Let's also not forget that spirituality, if you do some basic study and research of the history of spirituality, you quickly see that spirituality from the very, very beginning, 5,000 years ago, if you go back to ancient, ancient Hinduism and ancient um, uh, Judaism and ancient forms of Christianity and so forth, you see that all the greatest spiritual masters have gone to hardcore extremes to pursue enlightenment. And they developed technologies to do this. And some of these technologies are so hardcore that they're shocking to the average person. So let's take a look, for example, at yoga. Yogic techniques. I don't mean the yoga that we do at gym class. I mean old school Hinduism yogic techniques. What were those? Those were special, very exotic ways of breathing and manipulating your mind so that you can reach union with God. That's what it was. In fact, some forms of yoga are so extreme that what they do is they will snip the little ligament that attaches your tongue to the bottom of your mouth. That thing right there. They will actually snip that with a knife or with scissors. Why is that? So that you can, so that the yogi can take his tongue and curl it back up into his throat, up his nostrils, because you can't do that easily without snipping that ligament, so that he can breathe a little bit more efficiently, so that he can attain enlightenment faster. Now, if I told you, if I came up here and I said, hey, you know what, let's go snip that ligament in your mouth, you would say, wait a minute, Leo, that's a bit extreme. I don't know if I want to do that. Well, the yogis have been doing that for thousands of years. What about starvation? People have been starving themselves near to death, not just fasting, but actually starving themselves since the beginning of spiritual traditions. They've been doing that, right? Think of Jesus, think of the Buddha, nearly starving themselves to death so that they can put themselves in a state of mind that would produce some sort of higher consciousness, visionary experiences. Think of the Native Americans. They have traditions like the vision quest where they send you out into the wilderness into a barren desert with uh, no food and no water for like three or four days. And you're on the brink of death out there in the scorching sun with no water until you start hallucinating and you start to see visions. And that was done for spiritual purposes. Or think of the uh, Sundance, Native American Sundance tradition, where they will actually get you out in front of a tree. They will take these metal spokes and they'll stick them into the skin, the flesh of your abdomen, producing lifelong scars. They will tie a rope to those metal skewers that they stick through you, and then you're going to spend two or three days running around that tree that they tie you to with that rope, singing songs and dancing in the burning, scorching heat in order to experience some sort of visionary higher consciousness states. And that will leave you scarred for life. Those scars don't completely heal. Pretty radical, huh? But also consider baptism. Old school baptism, you know what that was? They would take your head and they would submerge you under the water until you were nearly drowned. And only then would they lift you out of the water. What was the purpose of that? The purpose of that was to put you on the very brink of death and then bring you back to life. And then that was supposed to have some sort of spiritual effects. Think about asceticism. Ascetics have existed for thousands of years since the very beginning. These are people who went off and lived by themselves in the mountains, 
isolated for decades, all by themselves. And if you think that that's not hardcore, think about the fact that 3,000 years ago, when you became an ascetic, you couldn't order shit on Amazon shipped to you. You couldn't go to a grocery store and stock up on canned beans and rice and this kind of stuff. Yeah? So asceticism was like a life and death decision. You have to live out there. There are like marauders and thieves and robbers and warlords who could come and kill you anytime. You're completely defenseless living there by yourself on the mountain or in the forest somewhere or in the middle of a desert. That was a hardcore life and death decision to become an ascetic. Also, we know that mushrooms, psychedelic mushrooms, have been the foundation of many religious traditions, including the Christian tradition, including Native American traditions, South American traditions, African traditions, Indian traditions, and uh, Aboriginal Australian and New Zealand traditions. See? Uh, in Hinduism, one of the oldest texts in Hinduism is the Rig Veda. And there, they cite a substance called Soma. We don't exactly know what Soma is, but our best guess is that it's a psychedelic mushroom. Perhaps the Amanita muscaria mushroom, or the psilocybin cubensis mushrooms, or some variation on that. But clearly, they highly regarded the mushroom. And in fact, because uh, the oldest tradition we have of non-duality comes from Hinduism, from India, uh, the whole thing might have started with mushrooms. That might be how human beings discovered enlightenment or higher consciousness. And then it might have spread from there. Also, the ancient Greeks were onto this. They were onto psychedelics. They have a 2,000-year-old tradition called the Eleusian Mysteries. It was a cult, a very popular and huge cult, where thousands of people every single year for 2,000 years, up until the fall of the Roman Empire, would gather in a temple and they would drink a substance called cacaon. This was a psychedelic substance that would send you into rapture and visions of various deities. What was in this substance? It's hard to tell, but the best that we can guess, it was some derivative of LSD. The Greeks found a method to derive LSD from ergot, which is a fungus that grows on wheat. And they did this for 2,000 years. And this wasn't just some sort of little... Um, side cult. This was mainstream. All the major Greeks and Romans of the time partook in this, including Plato, Aristotle, the Roman uh, senator Cicero, and uh, the Roman emperor Nero. And those are just the ones that we know of. There might have been even more than that that we don't know of on record. So, um, firstly, we have to acknowledge that psychedelics have been closely linked to spirituality from the very, very beginning of time. So there's nothing sacrilegious here about using psychedelics. Because, honestly, for people who are interested in knowing the truth and experiencing God, they don't care. These are hardcore people, and they will use whatever methods they can, including stuff like meditation. You know, meditation... In the East is a very hardcore tradition where you can sit for hundreds, thousands of hours in a row meditating your ass off until um, you reach enlightenment. And that's a technique. That's a very, very, very hardcore technique. It's very difficult to practice that technique. We have to be careful not to bring our ego into this and to say, well, we need to do it the one most hardcore way we can through meditation. You know, actually, as humanity is evolving, we should expect that new technologies will come online that will make it easier and easier to attain enlightenment. And that's, I think, what we're experiencing now because we have the uh, luxury of modern chemistry and we can really study these psychedelic substances, really understand what's going on, and that will only continue into the future. So this is not something to reject. This is something to embrace. Or at the very least, try it and verify it for yourself. So, uh... What I've found through my own research and personal experience is that 5-MeO-DMT is the most valuable tool we have for enlightenment. Because what it does is it produces pure, 100% ego death. Very consistently. More consistently than all other psychedelics. There's not a lot of visuals with this substance. 
You don't go on very mystical sort of journeys. You basically remain lucid throughout. You can think. Your thoughts are not distorted. They're very clear. And what happens is that it just raises your consciousness to infinity while at the same time reducing your ego down to zero, which is the ideal technology for enlightenment, if you think about it. If you think about it, you couldn't have even imagined a better technology than this. I mean, within just five to 15 minutes, you will experience God and yourself as absolute infinity. What more could you want from a technology? This is the perfect technology. Of course, you have to know how to use it. And that's what I'm going to talk about here is how do you use this substance? And I'm going to give you some guidelines and tips, discuss the pros and cons and so forth. This, just think of this as like meditation, taking your current meditation habit or your current self-inquiry habit and multiplying it by a thousand. It's not a replacement. It's a catalyst. Okay. Make sure you get that. I'm not advocating that you stop self-actualizing, that you stop meditating, that you stop self-inquiring. No, all those things are still necessary. But we add the catalyst of 5-MeO-DMT, and that takes you to levels that you couldn't have ever imagined. By the way, I have a theory about enlightened masters. You know, sometimes you read those books and they say that somebody had an enlightenment experience and then they became fully enlightened in a flash. And they remain that way for the rest of their life. That's extremely rare. In practice, what happens is that you need to have multiple enlightenment experiences before they stick. The first one usually doesn't stick. So one objection people have is that, oh, well, 5 meo is just a temporary experience. Well, you know what? If you're meditating, if you're self-inquiring, you'll have many temporary unitive experiences that will not stick. So it doesn't, doesn't mean anything, right? The point is that each one gets your awareness higher and higher and higher and higher until finally something cracks in your brain and then uh, enlightenment is had, okay? My theory about enlightened masters is that firstly, there's a genetic component, a strong genetic component to which people become enlightened how quickly. Some people seem to get it really fast, uh, easier than others. And some people seem to never, ever get it in their entire lifetimes. Why is that? Because I think that there's a genetic component to how your brain is structured. And uh, my current theory is that actually 5-MeO we're finding that it's a natural substance in your brain. It's not a foreign substance. It's a natural neurotransmitter and that your brain can naturally develop it. So with enlightened masters, what I think is, is that their brain either has parts in it that naturally produce more 5-MeO, which makes it easier for them to become enlightened, or they have a higher baseline level of consciousness than the average person, and or they use techniques that develop the brain through, for example, meditation, concentration practices, yogic practices, self-inquiry, and so forth, they develop their brain over doing that year after year after year after year for thousands of hours to the point where their brain starts to pump out the 5-MeO or whatever other chemicals uh, are relevant to produce enlightenment and to sustain that enlightenment. Okay, um, So this idea that 5-MeO is not natural somehow, uh, well, Maybe it's not natural, but also consider maybe it is natural. Huh? So let's talk about 5-MeO and how it can be used. So firstly, it comes in two forms. The first form is the natural form, which comes actually from the uh, Bufo alvarius toad. Here's a picture of the toad. It's also called the Colorado River toad. It lives in only one part of the world, which is around the Colorado River in the Sonoran Desert, in northern Mexico and in southern Arizona. These toads spend the majority of their time hibernating, so you will not find them. They come out only during the summer in the rainy season for a few months, and then they go back to hibernation. These toads produce a, a substance on their skin from these glands that they have on their arms and their legs, and this liquid is 5-MeO plus some other chemicals, but basically primarily 5-MeO, and in this you can Take this liquid, you can collect this liquid, you can smoke this liquid, and uh, there you have your trip. You might have heard about uh, psychedelic toads. Well, this is where that myth comes from. So 
actually you can't lick psychedelic toads the way that people sometimes talk about it. You can only smoke the substance because it has to be burned first before it can uh, convert into 5-MeO, which is active in your brain. But these are, yeah, these are the psychedelic toads. You've probably heard of these. There's only one toad in the entire world that produces 5-MeO that we know of, and this is it. So that's one way to acquire this substance. Although, um, if you ever get the idea to go out there and go find some toads or whatever, just keep in mind that um, we don't want to put a strain on the toad populations because there's only so many of these toads don't kill these toads, don't harm these toads, and don't destroy their natural environment if you do go out hunting for them. The second form of 5-MeO is the synthetic form. This is uh, the kind of substance that you create in the laboratory. So we know how to create 5-MeO in the laboratory. Here's a picture of what 5-MeO looks like in synthetic form. It's an off-white, tannish sort of powder, which has the consistency of moist table salt. And the synthetic comes in two forms, either the HCL version or the free base version. This is important because the HCL version needs to be snorted, not smoked. And the free base version needs to be smoked and not snorted. All right. And this produces two slightly different effects. So this substance can be smoked or snorted. If you smoke it, it acts extremely quickly, within 10 to 20 seconds, and very powerfully. It just hits you like a sledgehammer. So, um, and then it lasts, how long does it last? Like 5 or 10 minutes, or maybe 20 minutes at the most that it lasts, and then you come back down. With snorting, the HCL version, you snort it, takes about 5 to 10 minutes to take effect. It comes on more gradually, but it's still very, very powerful. And then the peak lasts longer. It lasts for 30 to 40 minutes. And then after 40 minutes, you come back down to normal. Personally, I haven't smoked it. I've only snorted it using the synthetic form. And that's mostly what I'm going to be talking about here. But uh, you can read the trip reports of people who smoke it versus snort it. Um, there are similar experiences, just slightly different in the way that they act. I actually think that snorting might be preferable to what we're trying to accomplish here, which is we're trying to not only have a peak experience, but we're trying to understand what's happening to us so that we can take that understanding back with us into our everyday life. And I think that the uh, the length of the peak on snorting is actually more conducive to that. I could uh, scarcely imagine what it would be like to smoke this substance get pummeled by it, just absolutely pummeled by it for like five minutes and then come back down and then you're like, what the hell was that? I have no idea what just happened to me. It would be completely disorienting and very confusing. So um, the idea here is not only are you experiencing it, but that you're actually understanding what you're experiencing. It's very important that you use a milligram scale to weigh the dosages of these substances because um, whether you're smoking or snorting, because 5-MeO is so potent that every single milligram counts. A few milligrams means the difference between a light dose and a heavy dose. Speaking of which, what are the dosages? Here are the dosages. If you're freebasing it, which means you're smoking it, then you're going to use slightly lower dosages. 10 milligrams is a good starting dose. 15 milligrams sort of an average dose. 20 milligrams is a high dose. 25 milligrams is probably the most you should ever do. And anything above 25 milligrams is probably overkill and can um, create health risks. Below 25 milligrams, you should not have health risks if you're a, a normal, healthy individual, not on medication, and you're not mixing this with alcohol or any other stuff. The HCL version you need to take a little bit more of. So 20 milligrams might be a good starting dose. Uh, 25 might be medium, and then 30 milligrams might be a breakthrough dose. And anything above 30 milligrams, you got to be careful with because you're starting to get into uh, territory that might cause you health risks. If you overdose on 5-MeO, what's probably going to happen most likely is you're going to go unconscious for the duration of that experience, and you're just going to wake back up 10 or 20 or 30 minutes later um, not knowing what really happened to you. 
You can also experience seizures. You can experience all sorts of heart issues because it elevates your heart rate, elevates your blood pressure, and so forth. So you do have to be careful there. And I'll talk more about that as we continue. Um, the highest I've done is 30 milligrams. That was my breakthrough experience to experience absolute infinity. <sighs> That's what you should be aiming towards is a breakthrough experience. You don't want to just try this substance and then just see what it does once. You want to work to the breakthrough experience. Start low, work up high until you get your breakthrough. Okay, That way you know that you're not uh, going to overshoot if you slowly work your way up. What's the procedure for snorting the substance? This is interesting. I did some trial and error and found a pretty good method that works for me. Let me share it with you. First, what I do is I weigh out my dose into two halves. So if I'm going to take 30 milligrams, let's say, I'll weigh out 15 and then another batch of 15 milligrams. Why two halves? Because you got two nostrils and you want to um, divide the dose equally between the nostrils so that more of it can be absorbed. What you do then is you create a little plastic tube. You can either get a plastic straw, cut it so that it's short, or you can take a little piece of paper or like a post-it note and roll it up into a little tube, short little tube, which you can stick in your nose and then snort this, uh, these two piles of uh, white powder. When you snort it, it's going to feel like you just snorted some finely ground white ground pepper into your nostrils, which you can imagine is going to burn and sting a bit. And some people don't like that sensation. But actually, I find it kind of uh, oddly um, interesting and kind of like pleasant. It's not pleasant, but it's kind of like this odd, interesting sensation, which isn't too much of a problem for me because the experience you're about to go into is going to be so freaking explosive and crazy that you're not going to have any issues. You're going to completely forget any little physical discomforts that you have from snorting the substance. Now, the key that I found is that after you snort it, go quickly sit on your couch because you got about five or 10 minutes until this really hits you hard. And what you need to do as you're sitting on your couch and just relaxing is tilt your head upside down so that this substance doesn't leak out of your front nose and it doesn't leak back out down your throat. If it leaks out the front or the back, you're going to lose a large quantity of the substance, it's not going to absorb into the nostril tissues and you're not going to have the trip that you were expecting. It's going to be far, far, far less. So what you need to do, what I do is I sit on the couch, I tilt my head down almost until it's touching the carpet floor and I just leave it like that for about five or ten minutes because I, I just want the all that stuff to kind of accumulate in my nose and not drip down anywhere. And uh, get absorbed into the flesh of the nose and then go straight to my brain. And as your head is down there, you're going to start to feel this thing quickly, quickly taking effect on you. After about five or 10 minutes, when you know that this stuff has really gotten absorbed, then you can lift your head back up and just sit back and relax. Uh, you're probably going to have still a little bit of leakage. So have some tissues handy to just kind of like uh, wipe your nose, but also keep sniffing it all in. Don't let it leak out <laughs> like this. Just Keep sniffing it in throughout the whole experience so that you can get as much of your trip as you can. You don't want to waste the substance. And then, uh, yeah, all you got to do is wait five or ten minutes and then it's going to hit you really, really hard. What's the experience feel like of taking 5-MeO? Well, at first, what you're going to experience is you're going to experience terror, fear, and panic. The first time I took 5-MeO, I took a small dose just to test it out. And I experienced a full-blown panic attack. Uh, because remember, what the substance does is it rips your ego away from you. Your ego is everything you hold dear in life. It's your entire life. You're facing your death here. And I'm not exaggerating. It will feel like you're dying at first. Not because it's painful, but just because it feels like you're going away. And you're not sure if you're ever coming back. Of course you're coming back. But you're not sure of that when it's happening to you and it feels quite weird and your consciousness starts skyrocketing and your ego starts dipping down to zero and that can be a pretty freaky experience if you're not ready for that. So you're going to have to face your own death before you can see God. 
you see? Because the only thing blocking you from God is your ego. That has to go. But that won't go without a struggle. So, you know, I've never had a panic attack in my entire life. I'm not a very panicky person. I'm pretty emotionally grounded. But here I took the substance and I had all these negative thoughts like, what did I do? Maybe I poisoned myself. Where is this going to take me? Because I knew it was going to be powerful. Although I still didn't know how powerful it was going to be. But uh, yeah, it made me freak out for about five or ten minutes. And what I had to do is just completely calm myself down through meditation and um, just relaxing my body, letting everything, all the muscles kind of relax, opening my body up to surrender to the experience. And so once I surrendered to the experience, it just took me over, overwhelmed me, and then I got to the peak. The peak experience is nothing short of experiencing God as absolute infinity. God is not a person. Don't anthropomorphize God. God is absolutely everything that's possible. That's what God is. So you can experience that. You can become that. And when you do become that, it'll be such a shocking experience to you that you will think your life has ended and that you have ascended to nirvana and that you have experienced full awakening. And it'll feel like this is it. This is permanent. Like nothing can ever touch you again. You will feel untouchable. You will feel immortal. And these will not be delusions. This will be truth. This will feel more true to you than anything you've ever known in your entire life. And you will immediately recognize that your entire life, what you call reality, what we collectively call human reality, that this is a, this is a dream and that you finally awoken from it. It's extremely powerful. It's a life-changing experience. You could meditate for... <clears throat> 10 or 20 years and not go this deep. It's that powerful. It's so powerful that I've read reports of 5-MeO being used to treat heroin addiction. It's very effective against heroin addiction. What they do is they take a 20-year heroin addict who's been living on the streets his whole life for 20 years, taking like two or three grams of heroin per day for 20 years, and they give this guy a hit of 5-MeO, and he's cured in one hit. Even though this guy has tried methadone, he's tried therapy, he's tried rehab many, many times, and nothing helped him. But he gets one hit of 5-MeO, he sees God, and his whole life has been uh, flipped upside down from that point on. That doesn't happen with every heroin addict, but it's actually a quite common story among heroin addicts. And this substance, 5-MeO, is um, gaining popularity and it's being used in medical contexts, for example, in Mexico to very successfully treat uh, substance addiction from heroin to other drugs to alcohol. It's proven very powerful for that. Now, imagine, imagine how powerful of an experience you would have to have if you were a 20-year heroin junkie and nothing has ever helped you that one of these experiences cures you. Imagine how powerful that experience would have to be. Now you have a little bit of an idea of what 5-MeO can offer. Now some people might say, well, Leo, what you're talking about here sounds way too good to be true. What's the catch here? I mean, it sounds like you're saying I can just take this pill and get enlightened. Well, not so fast. First of all, there's a lot of ignorance about 5-MeO. You wonder, how come is not everybody taking 5-MeO? Well, first of all, it's illegal in many places. Uh, and it's illegal because people don't know what it can do. Also, most people don't know about it. Even people who do psychedelics don't know about 5-MeO because they're simply ignorant. You know now because you've been very lucky to hear about it from me. And chances are, if you haven't heard it from me, you haven't heard it from anybody else. So at this point in human uh, civilization and history, most people don't know about 5-MeO. If everybody knew about 5-MeO, we'd be living in a totally different world. So there's the catch of ignorance. There's also the catch of closed-mindedness. Most people, including maybe yourself, are too closed-minded to actually take this substance and to experience everything it has to offer you. Because I'll tell you this, if you take this substance, every single one of your worldviews and beliefs, whether it's religious or scientific or atheistic or whatever, will be shattered 
Are you open to that? If you're not, you won't even come close to this substance. That's a freaky thing when all your beliefs and ideas about reality are shattered within minutes. Many people can't handle that. Many people aren't emotionally or psychologically mature enough to deal with that. There's also your ego, which is a huge catch. Your ego will do anything it can to maintain itself, to maintain its delusion, and to not die. And with this substance, you're going to be subjecting your ego to death. And you might say, well, Leo, that's fine. I don't care about ego death. That's not a big deal to me. You don't know yet what it's like to face your own death. For real. Not as an idea, but for real. Right now, you feel like, oh, yeah, I can do it. I have no problem with that. But then when you snort that substance up your nose, and you got five or ten minutes until it starts kicking in, oh, and then you're going to feel it. Then you're going to feel what it's like and whether you're really ready or not to die. And whether you can surrender to that, or whether you're going to resist yourself and fight it all the way. See? So that's a huge obstacle and a huge catch here. Also, 5-MeO is quite rare. It's difficult to find. It's not popular amongst regular psychedelic users. You're not going to find your weed dealer providing you with 5-MeO. You're going to have to go out of your way to find it. Just several years ago, it was outlawed in the United States. Believe it or not, four years ago, 5-MeO was technically legal. Uh, also, very recently, just a year ago, it was outlawed in China. That's important because the majority of the production of 5-MeO takes place in China. So now that it's been outlawed in China, you can't manufacture it there legally, and so supplies of it are very short. So that makes it even harder to acquire. 5-MeO is still legal in some areas, for example, in Mexico. Still legal in Mexico, so in theory, if you wanted to try it legally, you could go visit Mexico, find somebody who provides it, and have your trip. And by the way, that would be totally worth it. If you had to pay several thousand dollars, or even travel halfway around the world to Mexico to try 5-MeO, it would still be totally worth it. Because this experience will completely change your whole life forever. See? Um, if it costs you a million dollars to have this experience one time in your life, it would still be worth it. This experience is worth more, I think, than, you know, some people pay millions of dollars, some rich people, to, like, fly out into space. They'll pay 10, 20 million dollars to have the Russians fly them out into space so that they can look down on the Earth. And that's, like, supposed to be a very cosmic sort of experience, right? Once-in-a-lifetime sort of experience. I would bet you that 5-MeO will do more for you than if you flew out into outer space and saw the Earth from, uh, from your spaceship. That's how powerful it is. And, you know, people travel to places like Peru all the time to do ayahuasca ceremonies, and uh, 5-MeO is way more powerful than ayahuasca. Uh, it's going to be way more pleasant than ayahuasca, and Peru is much further than Mexico from uh, most places. Another catch is that one dose of 5-MeO will not enlighten you. I think it'll give you a genuine experience of your absolute nature as God and absolutely everything and also nothing, but it's not going to make you permanently enlightened. Okay. So, is it a magic pill? Well, I'm going to talk more about that as we continue, because I think that there's a possibility to use it towards enlightenment, but that's more than just the way that most people use it. Most people, even if they have tried 5-MeO, they took it once or twice, they experienced something crazy and far out there, and now they're just back to normal, and that's it. But that's not what I'm interested in. What I'm interested in is full enlightenment. How do you get full enlightenment? Well, first of all, you have to be serious about enlightenment. And most people who do psychedelics are not. They don't even know about enlightenment. That's another catch to this whole thing, is that most people are not serious about non-duality. So even if they do psychedelics, it doesn't do much for them. You have to be a student, a deep student of non-duality. You have to be a deep practitioner of it already 
to really get the benefits here. Also, there's a risk of abuse with 5-MeO. It could have potentially lethal and other serious uh, psychological and health consequences. You could overdose on it. You could uh, do it in the wrong setting. You could uh, do it at a party or something like that. You know, um, you could do it and you can misinterpret it because you haven't really studied non-duality. So there's a lot of potential uh, catches here and why this thing is not just a straightforward magic pill that just any idiot can use. You have to be careful and intelligent about how you use it. It's a powerful tool, and like every powerful tool, it can be abused. Speaking of which, let me give you some warnings and tips for how to use this safely and effectively. First of all, remember that this will create an experience of total psychological death in you. Are you ready for that? Can you handle that? Or are you going to freak out? If you're going to freak out, don't take it. If you can't surrender to death, don't take it. Also, don't take 5-MeO if you have a heart condition or high blood pressure. Because what will happen, especially in the first 5 or 10 minutes, is that your heart rate will go through the roof as you're experiencing your death. Also, don't take it if you are on various kinds of medications, especially something like antidepressant medication or antipsychotic medications. Do not mix 5-MeO with those. Don't take this if you're mentally unstable. Don't take this if you're under 21. I don't recommend it, because you're not going to be mature enough to fully understand and appreciate and integrate this experience. Chances are it'll just freak you out and leave you confused. Build your foundation first, then you can take it. Always start with a low dose. And this is interesting because with 5-MeO, actually, the low dose is more likely to give you a panic attack than a high dose. Because what the low dose will do is remove your ego, sort of, but not give you a big enough boost to your consciousness to experience absolute infinity. So the low dose actually will freak you out more. But I still think you should start with a low dose, get the freak out out of the way with your first dose, and then all your successive doses will go a lot smoother. They'll be a lot easier. Also, don't start with a large dose because you just don't know how much it'll affect you. You know, for some people, they might be very, very sensitive. And so for, the, for them, even an average dose might actually turn out to be too high. It's super critical that you weigh your dose very carefully and accurately. Make sure you have a milligram scale. Remember that every milligram counts. And make sure your scale is calibrated properly. Only do 5-MeO in a safe setting. I recommend only doing it at home. When you have the whole day off, nothing to do. You've removed all the dangerous objects in your house, all the knives, all the swords, all the guns, uh, any sources of fire or flame. And do it in your living room where you don't have any sharp corners, nothing you can hit your head against or uh, something like this, right? So make your setting very, very safe, comfortable, and so that nobody ever distracts you. Don't do it outside. Don't do it at a party. Don't do it with a bunch of friends. That's all nonsense. Surrender fully to the experience. This is the number one rule that you need to remember to have a good experience on 5MEO. Fully surrender. What does this mean? This means when you're starting to have negative thoughts, you're starting to freak out and tense up, and your body starts to contort and close up, what you need to do is, the only thing you really can do, is open your body up physically. Make sure your arms aren't crossed, your legs aren't crossed. Open yourself up. Relax your body. Let every muscle go limp and loose. And relax your mind. Use any kind of meditative techniques that you have. And just calm yourself down and completely give yourself over to the experience. Come what may. That means if you're going to die, you're going to die and you're fine with it. You just accept it and you give into it. Now, that's a tall order to fill. Many people can't do that. In which case, well, you might have a, a horrible, horrible, horrible experience. So 5-MeO will blast you into absolute infinity, but you still have control. 
And if you decide that you don't want to go to absolute infinity, if you decide that you're going to hold back and you're just going to sit in your little ego and that you're not ready to die and all this kind of stuff, if you get egotistical, once you've taken the substance, um, that's going to be like pushing the gas full throttle in your car and hitting the brakes right after. That's going to be the effect. It's not going to be pleasant, right? You will basically eliminate the possibility of all the positive, amazing stuff you can experience and magnify all the negative stuff because you're going to be resisting it full throttle. And uh, that's going to be terrible. If you read trip reports about 5-MeO, it has a huge range of trip reports from the most horrific and hellish that you can possibly imagine to the most beautiful and divine. Why is that? I think mostly that is because people who try it are not actually aware of what the ego is and what it means to surrender the ego. They haven't done any kind of preparatory work. They don't understand non-duality at all. And so they're freaked out. And once they start to get towards the higher end of the experience, they say, nope, 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 nope. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not ready to die. And they're going to cling. And then that's when they have their hellish experiences. So if you've taken the substance and you're sitting there on the couch and you're just waiting for time to tick down uh, and you're freaking out, just remember what Leo told you, fully surrender and open your body. Fully surrender and open your body. This is the thing that will save you. And the last tip I'll give you is give yourself time to integrate the experience. So after you come back down, you're going to be sort of like normal, except you've seen something that no other human being around you has ever seen. This is going to freak you out. It's going to shatter your notions of what's real and what's possible in life. Everything's going to be turned upside down in your life. You're not going to know what this means for your relationships, for your career, for your marriage, for your kids, and everything else. And so you need to give yourself time to, to work through that. Not to hide it under the rug, not to run away from it, but to work through it. That's where the real growth comes in. See? A lot of people think like, oh, this is a magic pill. It avoids you having to do any emotional work. Actually, no. This is a catalyst that thrusts you into dealing with all your inner demons. And the more inner demons you have, the more shit you will have come up and that you will have to deal with. See? So be prepared for that. Give yourself time the day after to do that. Don't just run off to work and then shove this under the rug. Also, 5-MeO seems to have no tolerance, which means you can take it often. If you want to take it every day, it seems like you can. I haven't tried it, but it seems like you can. But I would recommend that you don't take it more often than once a week. Just so you make sure you don't develop a psychological dependence on it. This substance is not addictive. But any substance or anything in life you can develop a psychological addiction to. You can develop a psychological addiction to sleeping or walking or talking, right? So, um, so you can with 5-MeO. But it doesn't seem to have a tolerance like other psychedelics. So you can do it often. But I recommend waiting at least a week. Probably a good idea if you're going to be taking this habitually in order to work on your consciousness, probably want to do it maybe twice a month at the most. Because this is such a powerful substance, uh, there is no way you can integrate this stuff in just one or two days. You need to give yourself time to come back down, really think about it, integrate it fully. Um, after my last breakthrough dose, I haven't done it for a month even though I kind of want to, but every time I want to, I kind of just go, oh man, it was such a powerful experience. I don't know if I'm ready right now to handle that. Maybe I'll wait another week. And so I've been waiting a week, a week, a week, a week, and then a month has gone by. See, And I don't feel like it's addictive to me at all. It's actually quite frightening. It's quite challenging. It's very emotionally challenging, even though it's very beautiful. What about the health effects? Well, I think that if you're a normal, healthy, psychologically mature adult, then you should not experience any negative health effects. But of course, we can't be sure about that. There's risk with any medication you take, whether it's a non-prescription drug or a prescription drug, right? We just don't know. That's why you want to try small doses. But from anecdotal evidence, 
from other people who have done it, it seems like you can do 5-MeO hundreds, maybe even thousands of times without any negative health consequences. One of the reasons I think that that is, is because 5-MeO is a neurotransmitter that naturally occurs in your brain already. So the only way you can really damage yourself is by overdosing, which you have to be careful about. But if you don't overdose, I don't really see uh, serious long-term consequences. Um, generally speaking, remember your health, I don't know about your health, I don't know about your genetics, everybody's different, everyone's unique. So the risk is totally on you. You have to take full responsibility if you want to play around with this substance. And the other thing I'll warn you about is that you have to be careful with uh, how 5-MeO potentiates all their psychedelics. After you do your 5-MeO trip and you come back, and then let's say a month later you want to try some mushrooms, or some LSD, or some DMT, regular DMT, you might be shocked to learn that your mushroom trip, even at the low doses, is going to be epic. Epic, 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 and deep. Because after 5-MeO, everything else becomes a little bit like 5-MeO. And you start to see the infinite, the absolute infinity, on any psychedelic that you're on. I took a mushroom, um, a low mushroom dose, about a week after my big 5-MeO experience. And man, that, um, that was a really tough mushroom trip. Because it, it really took me by surprise. It blindsided me. Because I was expecting some fun little light experience. And I got this very, very heavy, deep um, dose. Uh, because it was potentiated by the 5-MeO that I had a week prior. Uh, can 5-MeO be used for enlightenment? That's the million dollar question. And uh, that's the most beautiful thing I think that I've discovered is that it can. My theory is that 5-MeO, if used repeatedly and in conjunction with meditation and self-inquiry and personal development, if all of that done is, if all that is done simultaneously over a long period of time, like over the period of a year, then what will happen is that eventually these peak experiences that you're having on 5-MeO, they will crack your mind open. They will crack the ego. They will sort of deliver a mortal wound and eventually your ego will bleed dry and you will then become permanently enlightened. That's my theory. I've discovered one person who has done it this way and it's worked for him this way. I will actually be interviewing that person. I actually already interviewed him. I just need to post the video and that will probably happen over the next month or two. So look out for that. That'll be very interesting. Um, but I also intend to field test this theory myself. So over the next year, what you will see with me, if you want, you stay tuned, watch me, and we'll see what happens to me um, with this sort of practice. What'll happen? What'll happen to my consciousness? Where will it take me? I'm still continuing my meditation habits, still continuing my self-inquiry habits, uh, still doing all the personal development habits. So all those are still in effect for me. This is just a catalyst. It's not really a magic pill because it's still emotionally taxing. This is not easy work. You will still have to work through all your inner demons. You'll just have to work through them faster. Rather than spreading out all this inner demon work over the course of 10 or 20 years, it's going to be condensed into the course of one year. You see? Faster, tougher, but also uh, the fruits should come faster too. This would be not much different than enrolling yourself, for example, in a Zen monastery because you want to catalyze your progress towards enlightenment. Well, this is sort of like that, just uh, a different technology. I actually think that 5-MeO culturally at this point in our human evolution might be the most important technology that we have right now. We don't need faster computers and faster airplanes and bigger nuclear weapons, all right? We've got enough of that. Humanity is really at a tipping point right now because collectively our ego is so vast and our ignorance is so deep and our wisdom is so shallow and our consciousness is so low as a species that over the next 200 years, we have a real chance of annihilating ourselves 
or damaging this ecosystem that we're on uh, critically, okay? Because right now what we have is we have materialism run amok, religious dogma run amok, political ideologies run amok, and um, there's no end in sight. It doesn't look pretty. Humanity needs to wise up and needs to wake up. And what's going to do that? The traditional enlightenment path? That's very, very fucking hard. It's grueling. I'm not even sure that most human beings can handle it given um, their upbringing and given their genetics, quite frankly. I don't even know if their minds and their brains can handle it. Um, but with 5-MeO, this is a technology that we recently discovered that can um, make God empirical, you see? It can make higher consciousness an empirical, tangible thing, a scientific thing, rather than some sort of airy-fairy, woo-woo thing only for deeply religious people. That's been the problem for the last 2,000 years is that we've had religious people, but those religious people have actually distorted religion. They have turned religion into a technology that actually prevents people from becoming enlightened rather than facilitates it. And then the scientific community has reacted against that because the scientific community thinks that all that is hogwash. And so the truth is lost in the midst of all that. Well, here we have the perfect technology. If there's anything that will make enlightenment mainstream, it's 5-MeO, because you can take it no matter who you are. Republican, Democrat, Christian, Hindu, uh, Muslim, young or old, um, developed or undeveloped, uh, rich or poor. You can take this substance and within 15 minutes, if you surrender to it and you're open-minded, you will experience the deepest wisdom that our religious traditions and our spiritual traditions are founded upon. And that will be a life-transforming experience for you that will break your ego down so that you stop creating this cycle of self-destruction, both individually in your life and collectively as part of the community and part of the species. So I actually think that 5-MeO is more than just uh, a psychedelic. And it's more than just a way to personal enlightenment. It really could be uh, the salvation of the human race. And so in the future, I anticipate that I'll actually be a champion of 5-MeO. And um, I look forward to getting more people to know about it because I think, uh, quite frankly, the, uh, the future of humanity could depend upon it. So follow with me. Follow my journey. If you want, see what you can experiment with on yourself. I will be adding some new books to my book list about psychedelics and about 5-MeO that will give you more of a, a deeper understanding of the tradition of psychedelics as it stretches back into our very beginning as a civilization, and um, that will be some good research. I always recommend that if you're going to get into psychedelics, make sure you do the groundwork and the research about where they come from and how they work and who's used them and what kind of experiences people have had. So. Um, check out my book list. Those will be coming soon. And uh, I will be releasing soon that interview with the, with the guy who I found who has become enlightened through 5-MAO use. That'll be pretty exciting. Uh, that's it. I'm done here. Please click the like button. Post your comments down below. Share this episode with a friend. And lastly, come sign up to actualize.org. This is my newsletter right here. Check it out. Check out my website. I got a forum. I've got a course there. I've got my book list there. Uh, the newsletter will keep you on track with this journey of raising your consciousness. I have a lot of mind-blowing resources that I will be sharing with you in the future. Tools, techniques, people you can go to, seminars you can visit, and so forth. I'm working on that stuff. I want to release more resources to you guys so that you can really get involved with this journey and you can find the most powerful methods and techniques to raise your consciousness. Because this is the greatest thing you can do in your life. This is what I've committed my life to, is raising my consciousness. Uh, and I'm really excited to start to get you to taste some of the really high-level stuff that I've been talking about for a long time, but that just been there's just been ideas for you. I'm excited for you to actually start to take action on these things I'm talking about, lay the foundation, and then use the more advanced techniques I show you to break through. 
break through that ego and see what else is there. See what else exists beyond you. You will be very pleasantly shocked and surprised. So uh, stay on board with me for that and sign up and I'll see you soon with more.